Listen to the people. Listen to humanity. Listen to the parent. Parent TV. Parent TV. Parent TV. Parent TV. Parent TV. Listen to the people. Listen to humanity. Listen to the parent. Parent TV. Undoubtedly, Africa is the best tourism destination on Earth. The continent is blessed with the most conducive atmosphere. To feel and enjoy these blessings, join the most productive one-week tour of the continent organized by Daylight Africa every September 2nd to September 9th to see beyond the fallacies about Africa on the mainstream media. Contact us at daylightafrica at gmail.com or call 718-8. Two two five 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 five. Daylight Africa, revolutionizing tourism industries in Africa. Hello, welcome to World Inkers Network. I'm Dustin Pickering, your noble and honest host. Today we have Professor Nandina Sahu, the Amazon best-selling author in 2022 is a major voice in contemporary Indian English literature. She has accomplished her doctorate in English literature under the guidance of late Professor Narajan Mohanty, Professor of English, Visva Bharti Santetakan. She has been widely published in India, USA, UK, Africa, Italy, Australia, and Pakistan. Apart from numerous other literary awards, she is a triple gold medalist in English literature. She has received the gold medal from the Honorable Vice President of India for her contributions to English studies in India in the year 2019. She is the author and editor of 20 books, The Other Voice, The Recollection as Redemption, The Postmodernist Delegation to English Language Teaching, The Postcolonial Space, Writing the Self and the Nation, Silver Poems on My Lips, Folklore and the Alternative Modernities, Volume 1, Folklore and the Alternative Modernities, Volume 2, Sukuma and Other Poems, Suva Nakara, Sita, a Poem, Dynamics of Children's Literature, Zero Point, and Selected Poems of Nandina Sahu, Winter 2020, Selected Poems of Nandina Sahu, Spring 2021, Rereading Jayanta Mahatma, Maha, uh, Sorry, Mahapatra, a song, half and half, shedding the metaphors, collected poems of Nandinta Sahu and collected poems of Narajan Mahanti. She is a the former director, of School of Foreign Languages, and is currently a professor in, in English at Indira Gandhi National Open University, New Delhi, India. Her areas of research interests cover Indian literature, new literatures, folklore and culture studies, American literature, children's literature, and critical theory. She is the chief editor, founder editor of Interdisciplinary Journal of Literature and Language, a biannual peer-reviewed journal in English. Professor Sahu has de designed multiple academic programs on culture studies, American literature, post-colonial literature, children's literature, Indian folk literature, and Indian philosophical thoughts for IGNOU and many other universities. Welcome to the show, Professor. How are you today? Namaskar. Nice to meet you. And uh, so it's it's good to see that you have a collected volume that just came out and is, is um, yeah. available now. So tell us about the process of compiling that and why did you decide to collect your poems now? And what can a reader familiar with your work expect from this new collected volume? Thank you very much, Dashan, for having me in this important discussion, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And about your question, uh, this is the book uh, that you're talking about, Collected Poems of Nandani Sangh, which is a book of 700 pages. Uh, wow. Well, in years, in 2023, March, mid of March, this book is published from India, from mm -hmm. Authors Press, New Delhi. Uh, this poem, this poetry collection is a, uh, you know, it's a collection of all my important poems published between 2004 and 2019. Those books, which were mostly out of, some of them were out of print, some of them were not available in the market. So my readers, 
and the scholars who are working on my poetry, they wanted a complete collection of my older poems. So that is when I decided that I can put all the poems together. And then a critical introduction is written by Professor Anand Prakash. He is an eminent professor from Delhi, from the University of Delhi. He has written a critical introduction to the book. And this book is kind of, you know, it's a compilation. It's a complete collection of my older poems. And about uh, my older poetry collections, you know, this is the first collection, The Other Voice. Mm -hmm. This was published in the year 2004. And after that, uh, I had another collection, The Silence, that was published in 2005. And then this is Sukuma and Other Poems. This was in 2009. And uh, then this is Silver Poems on My Lips, 2014. And uh, then this is Sita, a poem. This is my most important poetry collection because I have worked on Indian mythology in this collection. I will talk a bit more about it when we discuss more about my poetry. And my most recent poetry collection is Song Half and Half. This is published from Black Eagle Publications USA. And this came out in the year 2022. Towards mm -hmm. the end of last year, it came out. And this became Amazon's best-selling poetry book. Oh, wow. Right? Excellent. Yes. And yeah, so this poetry book is basically uh, written during the COVID period. Mm -hmm. I was struggling with COVID. And uh, mm. I wanted to write poetry during that period and poetry became my survival strategy. Poetry supported me, right? And mm -hmm. I wrote a lot of poems and then some of the poems are based on human relationships, on human psychology, again on Indian mythology. So many varieties of poems are there in this. And my recent poetry uh, story collection is this one, you know, Shedding the Metaphors. Mm -hmm. Shedding the Metaphors is a collection of 12 of my stories. Some of the stories were earlier published in different magazines and journals all over the world. And now I put all the stories together and this is a co collection and this book is doing very well. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that it's getting a lot of critical attention from Indian Academia and also outside. Very interesting reviews are coming up. I think you saw me on internet and you saw my book doing good on internet and that is how you got in touch with me. Mm -hmm. So I'm so grateful to you for that. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful to have you. And uh, so I'm, I'm curious, what role has reading played in your craft? And when did you first learn you enjoyed reading? I started writing and joyful reading maybe when I was hardly seven years old, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yes, my father was uh, a school teacher in rural Orissa, which is a part of, uh, you know, central uh, Orissa, and it's a part of India, right? And uh, he, he was a school teacher, and he had a very big library. And then I developed interest in going to the library and helping my father with the library work. And that is when I started reading all kinds of books. And my connection with ecology with environment started when I was hardly seven, eight years old. And I wrote a very nice poem for the farmers working out there. Mm -hmm. When we were living in our luxurious homes, we were enjoying our lives. I saw that the farmers were working hard in the fields. And that is when I wrote a nice poem for them. And then there was no looking back. I kept on writing. And when I was doing my master's degree at that time, there was an All India Poetry Competition with more than 10,000 entries. I just sent one poem to see how it goes. And then I stood first in that poetry competition among 10,000 or more poets. And then I thought, yes, now I can take my writing very seriously. Mm -hmm. Then I kept on writing. Mm. And then I came, yes, then I came to Delhi and uh, uh, in, in the year 2006 and I joined world's largest university, Indira Gandhi National Open University, with 8.85 million students. And then I got connected to my students through folklore and culture studies. I have designed several pro academic programs for my university on folklore and culture studies. And I have talked about Indian culture, world cultures, cultures from America, from England, from different and of Africa and Australia. And I have made a comparative analysis of all the different cultures of the world. And I have used it as a part of my research and pedagogy and also my creative writing. Oh, wonderful. So 
You have a poem called Half of Her Lovers or Half the World Away. I'm curious, who is the she in this poem, and why did you put men in single quotations? I thought that was interesting. Okay, that is one of my interesting poems indeed. It is an intriguing poem. Uh, uh, I, would you like to read out the poem a bit? Sure, go ahead. After that we can discuss, please read the poem okay. for us. Oh, I don't have it on offhand right here with me. I, do you have it? Yes, I have it. I have the poem yeah. with me. Would you like me to read it? Yes, please. Maybe a few lines from the poem. Just a second. So this poem is a part of, you know, this collection. Uh, a song, Half and Half. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, just a second. Uh, give me one second. And uh, in that poem, you know, I'm talking about how human relationships are so complicated, so complex. And the protagonist, uh, uh, the, the woman, the protagonist, she talks about uh, some of her friends, her lovers who are away from her. And mm -hmm. then without playing any kind of blame or without putting any blame on them that they left me, she is accepting their choices. She is telling that even if they are away from me, but what they have given me in this life, they have given me deeper understanding of life, love, happiness, and sorrow. So she is not at all judgmental about half of her lovers who are half the world away. Rather, she has taken the best from them. She has taken the humanitarian values from them. And in this poem, the girl, you know, the, the protagonist, the female, about for whom I'm using the word she, uh, she can be any woman, she can be mm -hmm. me, it can be autobiographical, or she can be any woman that I know in the society. So probably mm -hmm. that much I would like to say about her. Okay, that's very mm -hmm. interesting. Yes. So did you want to read the poem or do you, do you have it? Yes, the poem is here. Yes, this is a poem. Half of our lovers are half the world away. It's in the song Half and Half. Men who loved their wives and those who did not all fell in love with her when she was simply out and about in the world. Her men, I have put the men within single quote, which you have pointed out. Mm -hmm. Her men knew she was the brimming vessel with an eternal capacity to curl. Well, she didn't think much about love, neither of the safe love loves, nor of any loves in the conflict zone. Her dry, sardonic wit made them only fall in love more with rationality. Lost in time with the audacity of hope, she was found in eternity. Turning her wounds into wisdom, an expert at the law of diminishing marginal utility. She wanted to be forgotten from their collective memory when she had no, she had to wait to watch the slippers of couples in front of the cars while the couples were clicking away couple pictures to glory. A street arson poked a hole in her story in the midst of a deadly inner silence. Won't I even be allowed to wander lonely as a cloud, she thought. She, of course, had many longings and belongings. Her men every so often left her brain high and dry. Some other times they cared to say a proper goodbye. In any case, she didn't judge them. She did low lie. Her self-introspection and serious Reflection where a caricature of living, loving, her faith was bigger than fears with times intoxicants in her hands. There was no wind in there, just air to protect her men from fading. Above her outer skin, there were wordless walls with a fistful of sky. With time, invariably, her men turned into distant memories. She wore the stories of many a life but her own story lay buried at some place in a vault. One day, she lost the keys to that treasure that she had carefully concealed. She had that habit, habit save the best for the last. But 
much cared for stuff from her wardrobe were always lost so this woman had the habit of saving the best for the last but she never knew that something that she is saving she might lose so this is what happens in human relationships mm -hmm. we try to protect some relationships we are over possessive over protective about them but at the end of the day we see that those relationships were never there so probably this is what she means that be inclusive accept whatever life has to offer at this moment do not look for any future live in the present right excellent it's a good lesson to learn for everybody i think i like the poem too it's really nice thank you for sharing that so since you began you. publishing seriously has your writing style changed yes my writing style has definitely changed when i wrote my first poetry collection you know this one that i told you the other mm -hmm. voice uh, there is this why me syndrome sometimes if something wrong happened to me uh, when i was very young if something wrong happened then i used to think why me what wrong have i committed what mm -hmm. is my mistake but then as i grew up i tried to connect with the existential issues of life i try to connect with humanity i became more compassionate more empathetic i try to connect with people around me with nature with ecology with animals with birds with everything the flora and fauna around me and my language gradually changed hmm. from the micro world from the microcosmic world of nandini of myself i went to a macrocosmic world a, a bigger world where everyone was given importance everyone was given love compassion so i became more flexible and more inclusive similarly my language became more liberal in due course of time and it happened maybe because of my training as a teacher of english literature i have been teaching in indian universities since last 20 years so maybe because of my training in literary theory in research in mm -hmm. world literature in australian literature in american and british literature maybe because of major reading and taking classes english literature classes mm -hmm. and also becoming more flexible as a human being my language has definitely changed from the other voice till the current most important current poetry collection a song half and half hmm so what role has academia played in your understanding of poetry academia has played an important role you know in the contemporary culture of distraction if i can quote that you know the long standing division between theory and poetry is slowing down now no one is thinking about poetry as something different from theory for example when i talk about this book sita sita a poem my most important poetry collection as i told you in the beginning itself i have used indian mythology here i have taken the character of sita from the ramayan this is an indian mythical text mm -hmm. and then this poetry theory symbiosis has somehow influenced the book i have not just talked about sita as a woman a brooding crying complaining woman who was left alone by her husband ram during her pregnancy i haven't talked about her i have rather deconstructed sita i read the construction very seriously and i learned how to deconstruct a character and place her vis-a-vis -vis contemporary women i see a kind of sitaness in me in you in everyone around mm -hmm. when i think about the poetry theory symbiosis and then i talk about a bigger world then i think i do not remain i just nandini just a woman rather i become a teacher a folklorist a poet a critic and a writer of fiction so my theory classes my pedagogy my research all of them have definitely influenced my creative writing so when i am a folklorist the poet in me influences her when i am a poet the theorist in me influences the poet so all these identities are taken together this is how i have been trying to understand myself and to grow every single day through creative writing Wonderful. We're going to take a brief break, but we'll be right back with some readings from your poetry. Thanks for joining us today. Subscribe to our channel if you're watching right now. Thank you for Thank watching. You. We'll be right back. In a world where the quality of information available to poorer communities is doctored, tainted, and sometimes regressive, 
where the words fake news have come to mean other people's opinions. It is vital to rely on news platform with journalists who have feet on the ground and can report the truth. New York Parrot, a New York-based national and global news outlet, is changing the narratives of media operations. We focus on the news that matters, like safe empowerment, entrepreneurship, finances, health, security, politics and more. We strive to curb violence, racial and economic discrimination, and to promote peace and social economic development of multiculturally diverse world. As we give voice to the people, we also give your business a voice and make it heard. Get your products and services off the ground by advertising on our fast-growing platform. With so much of daily visits to New York Parrot, you can't afford to be invisible to prospective clients on the websites they trust the most. Our posts reach millions of people across the New York State and around the world. Advertising on our new site will unlock an audience of thousands of potential customers on your doorstep. New York Parrot is born to prosperously speak tomorrow for the voiceless. Welcome back to World Inkers Network, and I'm Dustin Pickering. Today we have Professor Nandina Sahu, and she's going to read a couple of poems for us. Uh, so go ahead, and I'll put you on here on the spotlight. So if you'd like to read some poetry for us. Thank you, Dustin. I would take over uh, from the last question that we were discussing, that uh, has my academic engagement influenced my poetry? Mm -hmm. I would take over from there. You know, when someone asks me, uh, is Nandini, the, the maker of Sita, a poem, uh, is a poet of her community or she is a poet of the institution or the university? Am I a university poet or like the university wits of the pre-Elizabethan period in English literature or am I an independent poet? You know, there is another larger question to this. Uh, has the university somehow influenced me? as a poet of a community. Anyway, my aim is not to establish, establish any easy one-to-one -one correspondence between my poetry and the postmodern theories, as I already told you. For such an expertise, one can be a bit of, you know, uh, hypothetical. I do not want to be hypothetical in my creative writing. I want to make it more flexible, more inclusive, and more of people's poetry. The engagement between postmodern theory and the point of the university, these two things, they definitely come together and then they definitely make me a better person. And uh, like when you ask me that, how would I describe the way I use language in my poetry? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is a very important question. For me, language is our behavior. The way we talk, the way we approach people through our words is our behavior. And uh, I take that very, very seriously. Gender equality is the fundamental right of every human being. So I think feminist linguistics can be and should be introduced as a part of the pedagogy of all the universities in the world. Something that really annoys me in public behavior in many countries, well, especially let me talk about my part of the world, is that if there is a public gathering, women and their voices are given less importance. Less time is given to the woman and less importance is given to the woman. I'm just reminded about one incident. Recently, I had been to, uh, you know, to the to the bank to, to talk about a loan, uh, a property, a loan. And then I went with one of my male colleagues. And uh, uh, the people in the bank, the bankers, they were looking at the male colleague and they were talking Whereas I was putting all the signatures on the checks. I was making all the payments, but they were looking at the male colleagues and they, they were not giving any importance to the woman. This happens everywhere. So I think feminist linguistics should be a part of our language, our language studies and our behavior. And look at the textbooks of many universities. The examples given will be mostly of he, not she. That will be of boys. Even I was looking at some children's books for the schools and I saw that the illustrations, the pictures, the paintings, 
given as a part of those books 85% of the pictures were of the boys like boys would be helping uh, boys would be playing around boys would be riding a bike and driving a car and playing archery and enjoyment only 10 to 15% of the illustrations were of the girl children and when there was a girl child, she would be helping the mother in the kitchen or she would be cleaning, she would be cooking. Mm -hmm. So this type of a stereotypical behavior that we have in our societies is not really going to help us to grow in a gender neutral manner. Just look at the color discrimination also. The race, caste, color and creed, all those discriminations are very much there in our social behavior. Probably, as a creative writer, we should address those issues. Mm -hmm. That we should talk about color-neutral behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded about uh, Lord Jagannath's culture from Odisha, where I hail. Okay, from where I hail, Lord Jagannath's skin is completely black. So his black skin stands in solidarity with the dark-skinned people. When the Lord of the Universe doesn't discriminate, between the dark skin and the white skin, then why should we do that? Probably this is the message of Jagannath culture, of eco-criticism. Mm -hmm. And Lord Jagannath, if you look at his body, he doesn't have complete limbs. His hands are up for this. Hands are broken. The hands are not constructed, not created at all. So that, for that, with that, he stands in solidarity with the differently abled people who do not have complete limbs as the standards of the world. When the Lord of the Universe doesn't have complete limbs and he stands in solidarity with the differently abled, probably as a creative writer, as a researcher and a teacher, I should try to imbibe those and use those as a part of my research, creative writing and pedagogy. And I take that very seriously. I try to use gender neutral language where there is no racism, no color, no caste, rather humanism, love, compassion, empathy, solidarity, inclusivity, and flexibility. Hmm. I wonder, curious, where do your sympathies in, in these regards come from? Uh, it's very interesting. I, you know, a lot of people would just scorn that, you know, or like a lot of, you know, people would just say, oh, that's, you know, Nandy Pandy or whatever. So where does that come from for you? Okay, thank you for asking this question. That's the part of this story collection, Shedding the Metaphors. Now, before I go to that particular story where I'm talking about my father, who I use as a God figure, mm -hmm. I would like to talk about uh, the, the title itself, Shedding the Metaphors. Now, what am I trying to shed at this point of time? What am I trying to get rid of? Why the title, Shedding the Metaphors? This story collection has 12 stories. And uh, the first story is a very different story, the title. And this is a romantic story where I'm talking about uh, two characters, the protagonist and his long distance love story, love relationship with a woman. And both of them keep supporting each other for two decades till one of them dies. And it's a very, very different story of human emotions. And the next story is Alternative Masculinity. This is a very interesting story once again. Here I'm talking about a male character who, who uses an alternative kind of masculinity in a subdued way. He is using his masculinity and then he is dominating the woman in his life. So I have tried to expose that kind of social behavior and it's a satire. It's a social satire. Mm -hmm. And the next story is Echoing in a Lullaby. This is a children's story, I would say. The protagonist, the child, it's from the child narrator's point of view. So the protagonist is talking about her childhood teacher who was her virtual mother. She supported her. She gave her complete love, care. And after many years, when the child grows up and she comes back to India from America, she discovers that there are so many complications in the life of her childhood teacher. And she attempts to take her into confidence and to give her support, care. So this is mostly about mental health and it's about subjugation. It's about mental health and about solidarity between two women, a girl child and her childhood teacher. And the next story is Shadow of a Shadow. I would recommend that it should be read from the queer studies perspective. This is about two lesbians and the, the women 
who come closer to each other through a kind of female bonding and then that leads to some kind of lesbian relationship between the two and how the society here indian society how the society reacts to that this is more about that so this story may be read from south asian uh, uh, society and its perspectives on the queer and the lesbians and the next story is that elusive orgasm the title of the story definitely is intriguing what is that elusive orgasm what orgasm the author is talking about well this story is not exactly about an orgasm or a sexual relationship this story is more about a girl child once again it's a social issue it's about incest a small girl at 16 she becomes the victim of sexual abuse at home but she doesn't understand that this is sexual abuse she accepts it as a part of her growing up years and then when she grows up after her marriage she finds it very difficult to accept her husband and she never gets an orgasm from her husband even if the husband is very loving very caring and he takes care of his wife but she never gets an orgasm from her husband so she tries to fulfill herself but then what happens is some kind of devastation some kind of disillusionment so this story is not exactly about an orgasm of a woman rather this is about incest and domestic violence it's a social issue and this story is should be read from that point of view and the next story is that juvenile love letter it's about the first love letter received by a girl at 15 and then how that impacts how that influences her life and she grows up under the influence of that letter and the next story is the two stories the quarantine and post quarantine these two stories were written during covid and uh, the stories are again about very complicated human behavior some pathos some humor these things dominate these two stories and they should be read together the quarantine and post quarantine the next story is the scarlet fly this is about a woman and about some society, social issues and then next is octopus octopus is a psychological story mm-hmm. and then the next is the wild stream this is a political satire a small child in the state of odisha in india during her childhood some politicians for the sake of their benefit they showed some dreams to that small girl and then during her growing up years she could never become a normal youth she could never become a normal woman she had that ambition of getting into the political lives of those people who actually used her to you know to to get some kind of political uh, attention from people and how her life becomes different after she was influenced or after she was you know taken by the politicians this is the story about and uh, the last story you know the, the next one is uh, being god's wife about which you are asking me this is my memoir mm-hmm. in the entire collection this is my memoir here i am talking about my father my father who was a school teacher who has given me the morals the ethics the upbringing that i have today i feel connected to the world i love humanity i hate nobody i am inclusive and then if i have all these qualities in me or even some negativities in me like some sort of insecurity some sort of nervousness all those qualities that i have today in me somehow i have picked those from my father i was my father's most favorite child if i can claim that and uh, this story is about to, it's written from my mother's perspective my father died in the year 2016 and then i met my mother and then we were discussing about my father when she narrated a few incidents from her youth and then she said that i was god's wife so i have seen life that mm. really made me think and rethink about the mental health of my father and about the dementia about the alzheimer all those kinds of issues mental health issues that old people have or that seniors have which we may not understand when we are young we may be judgmental about them we may be dismissive about them mm-hmm. but at this point of my time of my life i am neither judgmental nor dismissive about what my father thought or what he did rather i look at my father from my mother's point of view who thought that she was god's wife 
and this is my memoir, by reading this story, any reader, any researcher, people who are doing the research on my poetry, they can understand about my upbringing or about my style of writing, my themes, my techniques, or anything that I would like to say. This, this story or this memo is more like an interview that I am giving to somebody rather than a story. This is not fiction. This is entirely fact. I haven't mm -hmm. added anything in this. This is pure memo. Hmm. Well, thanks for joining us today on the show. Would you like to say anything in conclusion uh, and words of advice to our viewers for about writing or getting published or anything of that nature? Thank you so much, Dustin. It was a wonderful conversation. You have asked me such interesting questions. I'm very happy that you asked me those questions and I could respond to, more or less to, to those questions. About my advice to my readers, well, my advice is read more. Uh, mm -hmm. If you ask me how much do I read and how much do I write, I read 95% and only 5% of writing in wow. there. So I spend at least 10 hours every day in reading and writing. So out of those 10 hours, probably uh, nine hours I would be reading or less than one hour I would be writing mm -hmm. and read a lot of classical literature. Due to my young readers, I would see, I would say, read a lot of classical literature. Please don't go away from your roots. Read mythology, folklore. Folklore is one of the very important areas of my research and interest. I have designed a complete MA program on folklore and culture studies where I have taken world folklore, not just Indian folklore. I have taken world folklore. I have taken a Native American women's literature and the folklore. I have taken South African folklore, French, you know, and then Caribbean and so many, all the all the folklores of the world I have taken in that program. And uh, I would suggest the readers, the youngsters, they should read more of folklore and classical literature so that they can understand the contemporary literature. In order to understand me as a writer, one should know my historiography, where I belong to. Mm -hmm. I belong to the Indian women poets writing in English. And then I have taken my historiography from them. I have taken my style, my technique, my method of writing from them. Like T.S. Eliot would say that no writer should stand alone. We should belong to a tradition. The tradition that I belong to has made me what I am today. So I don't have any much advice to the youngsters rather than read more as much as you can. Don't go away from books in the age of social media, in the age of so many attractions Absolutely. all over the world. The television and OTT platforms and so much of excitement out there. Books are given least importance by the youngsters today. So maybe that is my only advice or suggestion to them as a senior writer. That there is no substitute to reading a book. Would you like to share any thank yous or shout outs while you're on the program at the end here? Thank you so much. Yeah, you do. Would you like me to conclude by reading one of my poems? Sure, go ahead. Well, uh, one of my poems in uh, in this collection, you know, uh, a song, half and half. Uh, well, I use a lot of humor in my poetry. Mm -hmm. Like humor studies is coming up in a big way today. In one of uh, uh, the seminars that I was attending, it was an Indian women's poetry seminar. And all the women poets were reading their poetry about suffering, about sorrow, about a lot of things. We were reading existential questions of humanity. Then you know what, Dustin? A small little girl, uh, hardly she would be 15 years, she just stood up and says, ma'am, why do women cry so much? And that was kind of eye-opener for me. I said, uh, baby, they are not crying. They are talking about the existential issues. Maybe women are more close to life or maybe they look at life in a different perspective. So probably they write more about the sorrows and sufferings of life. I said that, but at the same time, I did some kind of introspection mm -hmm. back home. And I thought that now I should write poetry of happiness as well, not just mm -hmm. about the realities of life, about the suffering and sorrow of life. Rather, I should also write the poetry of happiness, the poetry of success, positivity, optimism. So this book, this COVID poetry collection, this is full of optimistic poetry, romantic poetry, you know. That's and right. uh, uh, that's why I'm using humor, like one of the poems, The Parody of Love. Uh, 
this poem uh, the parody of love this is about uh, uh, you know a character when i i was having covid and that person wanted to please me a lot he wanted to take care of me he wanted to please me he wanted to get gifts for me but i was somehow not willing to accept those <laughs> and then he felt very humiliated he thought just a woman a mere woman like you is not accepting my offers because he was a politically powerful man right and i was just a simple university teacher and he thought that he can overpower me he can dominate me by talking about his powers then he offered me a lot of things that i was not willing to accept then later on i thought i can create some humor out of it though i am not dismissive about men sometimes troubling women by their advances i would definitely not accept it but then i thought i can create a parody out of that so mm -hmm. i will conclude by reading that poem a parody of love uh, a parody of love with my love today about a lampoon a caricature of pseudo love to love with my true love it's, it's a burlesque this is the fun mood today about the conformist ah uh, his whatsapp status the guardian of ancient civilization so his whatsapp status was i am the guardian of ancient civilization so he claimed to be the guardian of a civilization right what pompous was he when he met me online over a lecture i delivered on culture studies he pretended and pretended to be a part of whatever i said and did he called himself even my personal singular guardian he said i am your singular guardian he imposed that on me and i was not willing to take that <laughs> he decided that i fell in love with him as he was so irresistible he thought he was attractive and most welcome on my vestibule words of flattery galore and psychophancy was his syllable he simply ordered me to be agreeable admirable and amicable he sent me orders be agreeable mm. i said i don't know you who the hell are you and he decided that i was only a shy woman when i shouted i said who are you i don't even know you he decided that i was a shy shy woman a woman's no is actually a yes that's what he decided i was not at all disagreeable after all the ornament of a modest woman is being amiable he called me sent mails he pretended that my silence was affable love you are so funny you created an innovative narrative out of it love in the time of covid so my real love my true love he says that this is love in the time of covid he talks about that person and he says this this is love in the time of covid when he offered me gift packets of ramdesivir steroids plasma medicines he hated my this interestedness in his gifts and bouquets of flowers he declared via emails that he looked great with biceps which i cannot but admire in fact any woman would fall in love with him i didn't pay any heed he was furious and demanded i would look conspicuous only if we walk together how would he have liked that a woman a mere woman didn't value his love his generosity and his acceptance he belongs to a school of thought where women are goddess mother deities but normal respectable women he believed in the shameless privileges and premises of the rich i could no do nothing to erase the feudal mindset he stood for hours in front of my house he was sure one day i would respond and submit to him without a doubt he used click bites in his emails and thumbnail links specially designed to catch my attention and to entice me he tempted me with promises of awards as if i was looking for those the subtle sensational misleading stuff he sent profusely love you don't belong to this world it's a world full of hegemony you believe in reverence for women here and now not just in the femme idol of a temple you wish to punish the man of false agony i assure you fools are better ignored for them you can cre create an ebony so i decided to ignore that person but then before i did that i wrote a humorous poem for him Mm -hmm. but then it would allow me i would just talk about a little bit about one important poem in this 
collection Ahilya's Waiting. Ahilya is a character from Indian mythology mm -hmm. who was cursed to remain a stone for centuries for no fault of hers. So the background of the story of the poem is Ahilya was the wife of Rishi Gautam. She was very young, hardly 16, 18 years old. And Rishi Gautam was very old and he never completed, he never fulfilled the desires of Ahilya. And then one day what happened? Lord Indra, he is again a mythical god. He became attracted by the beauty of Ahilya and then he disguised into the face of her husband, into the you know, in the body and the face of her husband. And then he came and he fulfilled Ahilya. He made love to her. And Ahilya thought that this is my husband. Where was that was actually Lord Indra. But then once she got the happiness, the orgasm, the completion as a woman from Lord Indra in the disguise of her husband, at that moment, the real husband comes in. And then he did curse her. He said that you have to remain like a stone for centuries together. Because you broke the modesty of a woman and you got physical, you got intimate with another man. And then Lord Ram will come one day after centuries, after hundreds of years, he will come and redeem you from being a stone and he will make a woman, make you a woman once again. And then I take over. In the year 2022, I become Ahilya. I'm writing in first person, Ahilya's waiting. So I'm asking. Am I actually Ahilya and waiting for Lord Ram to come and redeem me from a sin that I never committed? I never committed any crime by being intimate with Lord Indra who actually came in the disguise of my husband. I misunderstood and then I was fulfilled. I was completed as a woman. And then she invites Ram, the archetypal Ram. She says that, yes, you can please come and touch me but not to redeem me from any sin that I never committed. You can come and touch me like a man would touch a woman and complete her. And in return, as a complete woman, I would touch you and I would also complete you as a man. So this idea of fulfilling the desire, the need of each other and completing the lives of each other as a man and woman is there in the poem. So ultimately, Ahilya says that do not come to touch me and redeem me from any sin that I never committed. I would rather like to remain a stone forever because I am my own woman. I am my proprietor. I am my owner. Nobody is my owner. I would like to remain a stone or I would like to be completed as a woman touching a man and a man touching a woman. So this poem is about you know, the inclusivity once again. It's about a woman and her desires. It's about the, a woman and her life, her choices. No one should impose their choices on the woman. She mm -hmm. should have her own choice in life. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us today. It's been wonderful talking with you. You're watching World Inkers Network. Please subscribe to our channel. If you've missed uh, the interview, go back and watch it again. It was a wonderful chat and I uh, enjoyed speaking with her. Nandini, uh, wonderful talking with you. And uh, if you guys want to donate, anybody out there, you can donate to us at our PayPal, paypal.me slash nyparrot. And that's a place where you can send your money, uh, any kind of money you want to send, any, any number of donation. And uh, if you have, if you don't want to donate and you want to buy one of our books, we have plenty of books on the market. You can look at our website, worldinkers.com. We just released a book uh, by Vandana Kumar. It's an excellent debut collection and i think uh, that's wonderful you would you guys gotta check that out and uh take a look and maybe give it a review for us and if you want to be on the program you can take a look at uh publication.worldinkers at gmail.com you can send me your bio a headshot and uh I'll make a couple of sample works uh so i can be uh aware of what i'm reading and who i'm talking with uh, so you have an idea of your style of writing and anybody can be on the program, uh, you know, if you're a writer or if you're a creative thinker, uh, please be in touch with us. So thank you again, Nandini. And it's been a wonderful thank talking you. with you, a very interesting conversation. And uh, we'll uh, conclude the program here with my trademark, uh, you know, get to writing and reading as well.
thank you for watching thank you very much dustin thank you from on my personal behalf and thank you from india for having me here thank you so thank much you Listen to the people, listen to humanity, listen to the parrot, parrot TV.